Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Process Podcast. Patrick James. Edward Haynes. Hey, welcome back to the Process Podcast, my friend. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. We were just saying that we've spoken to each other quite a few times, uh, but our last two calls have just been voice calls. Uh, and yep. seeing your pretty face again is very <laughs> nice. It's good to see oh, you here. And you, and you, my friend. Uh, where in the world are you right now, Paddy, and what time is it? Uh, I am in northeast London, uh, in Stratford. Uh, it's approximately four minutes to ten um, on a cold winter's day, wet winter's day in London. That's um, where I am. I, well, I, th- I think I should I should provide some background to our listeners right now i mean we may have yeah. some i won't even say og listeners because it wasn't that long ago that you were here with us but uh we used to do catch-ups with ed and pad i think that was pretty much every couple of weeks i'd say we were doing an, an episode where we would just chat and talk about life and reflections and what was happening mm. kind of at that moment in time um and then of course you left and ever since then haven't been back on the podcast uh we've maintained a friendship uh, and I'd you know, love to see your journey unfold, but I'd actually just love to start with a bit of an update for our listeners. Like, why are you now in Stratford and why are you not in Hong Kong? <laughs> uh, okay, should we, should we go back to the beginning? Let's go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning. So um, I um, went back to the UK to spend time with my family um, and my girlfriend over Christmas. Um I hadn't, hadn't left Hong Kong since I'd arrived and uh, Christmas is an important time for me. I love Christmas. And my sister was about to give birth to her first child. And my sister and I are very close. So I thought it was imperative I got back, even with the kind of should I, shouldn't I. It was at, the, at that point, it was Hong Kong was in up there with its worst state in terms of shutting borders and people being upset about the fact that they couldn't leave, etc. So it was kind of on it was on a, it was on the fence um uh, decision to make but i felt that i needed to make it to be able to go home for a couple of weeks and then spend three weeks in quarantine on the way back um and then the day before i was supposed to fly back to hong kong which was like january the second or something like that they shut the borders um hong kong shut the borders from the uk going into hong kong um so had to reassess and were we kind of sat tight for a couple of weeks thinking oh maybe that is just short term but hong kong did the same process that they did um way back when i was trying to get out to hong kong where i actually had to end up going and doing a washout or however you call it stopover in another country where the where the um covid rates weren't so low weren't so high sorry um so i then ended up going to dubai um and staying there for two weeks um and had booked my flights, was staying with a friend in Dubai, I booked my flights to fly back from Dubai to Hong Kong. And then um, the day before I was supposed to fly from Dubai to Hong Kong, they then cancelled the flight path from Dubai to Hong Kong because of COVID, positive COVID cases. Couldn't get a flight from Dubai to Thailand, couldn't get a flight from Dubai to Bahrain, Doha. All these places were basically looking at options to go. I was running out of cash. Bear in mind, this was must have been, I think it was like March um, that I was, that, and bear in mind, I hadn't been uh, working since December. So my bank wasn't, account wasn't exactly looking healthy um, and then needed to get back to Hong Kong, but couldn't because the flights weren't letting me. I felt like I'd overstayed my welcome with my friend, staying with him and his girlfriend for two weeks in Dubai. So then you and I had the conversation on the phone and I said, I think in the short term, while it's still sticky, sticky, it's better to go back home and stay with the family just because they can support me a little bit while um, everything's going on. And then as and when the borders are reopen or it looks like it's a slightly less risky option to come back to Hong Kong, I'll do that, which we both agreed upon. Went back to the UK um, and then we kind of had the conversation that maybe I should start looking for some short-term coaching work. I was obviously looking for work to try and keep some cash flow, um, but maybe start looking for some coaching work. So I started putting the feelers out to a couple of people on social media and 
to some of the gyms that I'd previously trained in and some of the people that I'd worked with, etc. Um, and one of those people that I reached out to was Ollie March on um, from March on the company March on, um, which if people don't know is a pretty well known um, sort of functional fitness brand within the UK. Um, and I put some feelings out to him saying, this is my situation. Um, I'm kind of looking for work. Didn't really disclose whether I was looking for, you know, a short term temporary thing. I just said, is there any, like I see that you're hiring a lot of people at the moment. Is there any opportunity to kind of, you know, add some value? Like I, I have areas in these, I have expertise in these areas of the business. And I said, I, they, at the time, March on were programming through what up. I was like, I use what up every day with the process programming. So I'm very familiar with engagement and how to program, et cetera, on using what up comfortable with that system. I know that you're getting into the CrossFit space. I've been a CrossFit coach since 2013 um, and feel very confident that I can add some value into that area of the business. And then I also said, I'm, I'm a host on a podcast. I know that you have PFCA and a, and a March on podcast. I think I could add some value there. Anyway, it was, um, it was ideal timing for him because that same week he was actually putting out the feelers for um, a head coach for a new gym that he was opening in London. And um, he basically said, we had a Zoom call and he was like, why don't you come down for a training session um, and we can, you know, have a chat from there, get to know you and, you know, kind of like a sort of two dogs sniffing each other's bums as it were <laughs> uh in the park so that happened um went down for a training session it went well we had some lunch and then had a couple more training sessions anyway that sort of conversation continued at the same time as the um situation in hong kong being quite sticky i was still doing zoom sessions with my pts and my online clients for back in Hong Kong. I was still programming for clients remotely, still programming for Barbell Club and things like that as part of the process, very much still a part of the process programming. We had even done podcasts in Dubai and back in the UK and things like that. Um, and then it got to the situation where I basically spoke to you, Ed, and was transparent that this conversation had happened with Ollie and that um, there was something in the pipeline here um and you said fine keep me up to date with what's going on um etc cetera, etc cetera. so then it kind of got to the situation where um you the the borders started to open up or it looked a little bit more hopeful going from the uk back to hong kong either via routes or whatever um and you kind of said to me we're getting to that point where things are starting to open up. We're not in as much lockdown as we were before. Therefore, we kind of need the coaches back in, in Hong Kong. Whereas before there was actually no requirement because the gym was shut. So there was me going to Hong Kong would actually be a worse decision for me to do at that point back when it was difficult. So it was actually better for me to stay in the UK um, in the short term. And then essentially it was kind of not an ultimatum, but it was like, I need you to, you, you said to me, this is obviously my interpretation of the story. <laughs> uh, you, uh, you said to me, I need you to kind of make a decision um, on what your future looks like. This was at this point, um, I hadn't made, um, I hadn't been made an offer by March on and from Ollie. So um, it was essentially weighing up two opportunities with everything else that went into that as well. So obviously I had built, very strong relationships and friendships with everyone in Hong Kong, coaching staff, as well as members. I was established as a personal trainer. I was established within my reputation within the gym. Um, I was very happy in Hong Kong. There was, there was, there was I, the only thing that I was lacking a little bit of contentment was, was the fact that I was doing a long distance relationship with my girlfriend who was originally from Hong Kong. Um, and then on the other side was the opportunity in the UK. Um, something that I've, I've always wanted to do that I've ne I had never done before is live in London. Um, and it was something that was like a scratch that I wanted to itch. Um, the opportunity was different with March on than it was at the process. It was more kind of functional fitness and it would probably have a little bit more seniority to the role. And in terms of a brand, March on are very strong. Um, and I think that 
everyone knows how can see those that follow March on how quickly they are progressing and how quickly we're we're moving up and building a reputation in the UK and elsewhere. So it was kind of like, do I take this opportunity where I have I don't know how well I'm going to gel with the team. I have had some inkling and I had uh, built some really good relationships with the people that I had started to meet. Um, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know whether this new gym that's opening up in, in London is going to be a success. So it could be in six months time, I'm actually out of the job and I've got to go back to square one again. Um, and then on the flip side, I'm walking away from the, 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 the most growth I've ever had, both personally and professionally within the space of a year. Like how much, how much growth would I then have if I stayed at Hong Kong, both professionally and personally. Um, but I would be away from my family, away from my sister, away from my mum and dad, um, potentially away from my girlfriend, depending on what she would do. So it was kind of like the two opportunities alongside the benefits and positives of the different groups of people and the relationships I'd had. And um, I think that a lot of the pull for me well, I felt that the, the opportunities professionally had different positives and negatives. So to me, they were kind of on a par. Um, and where I felt the difference was, is that being closer to my family and facilitating a relationship um, with Kiara, my girlfriend, was going to be easier taking the opportunity in the UK. Um, in terms of long term, I think that I also felt that having seen Marshall's growth over the last couple of years, I felt that in the next two years or three years, whatever, I think the company would be in a stronger position. And that was something that I felt was a better springboard for me if I was being selfish in terms of my career. So I think with all of those, those options, I basically, without, Really long story short, without having the offer from March on, I decided to, I said to you, I'm going to have to hand in my resignation because obviously you need an answer and I haven't got an opportunity lined up here. I haven't been given an offer, but I'm going to take the risk. And if it doesn't pay off, it doesn't pay off, but I'm all, I'm comfortable to take risks in my life. Like that's, that's not an issue for me. So I was like, fine, let's see what happens. Pull the trigger and go from there and did get the offer and then went through from there so really long story short it was essentially a crossroads of am i going to come back to hong kong do i take this opportunity that i haven't been offered yet um and and go that way so i took the opportunity in the uk and that was in maybe april i think it was or was it may one of those anyway it's now october the gym opens first of august officially um, and we've been steadily building ever since. So here I am. Nice. I'd say you, my story lines up pretty much perfectly with that one. But there is, there's one part of it I want to challenge you on, though. Please. And I, I wanted to challenge you this. I didn't. And the challenge is the wrong word. I guess it's question question you on. And I, and I mm. wanted to ch- question you it question you on this at the time, but I don't think you were in the right space to answer mm. it. But I think something that, and you've you've alluded to this the whole time in retelling the story and the whole time that you were really open with me and I really appreciated that openness, um, you know, throughout the entire, that whole journey when you were basically like, I don't know what to do. And, you know, essentially in that position where you're just weighing up opportunities and basically, you know, risk versus reward was basically like mm. what you were going, going through. Um, and mm. it was quite an extended period, but I could, you know, when you just know with someone, that I knew what what it is that you wanted. And actually I felt I knew what it is that you wanted before the March on job even came into the fray, which right. was which was a relationship, love, friendship. London, I know had been something that had, had been like on your radar. Uh, mm. when you when you first arrived in Hong Kong, I asked you what was your aspiration, what was your dream? And you said mm. you would like to one day move back to the UK and open a gym. And yeah. so like I always had in the back of my mind that Paddy at some point was probably going to leave and go back to the UK. I didn't know when that was going to be. It ended mm. up being a year, but I thought at some point it's going to happen. Mm. And uh, and of course, I could be completely wrong on this, but before the March on thing really even started to transpire, before any job actually started to transpire, 
I think you being back in that environment and being around love, family and connection um, had already started pushing you that way. Mm. And then I feel like, it, you know, what it felt like for me was that that was going to be the answer. And then you just got this beautiful cherry on top that you got this amazing company, you know, which was, you know, very on par, like you said, in different ways to what you'd been a part of. And I don't know, maybe that was the thing that finally pushed you over the, over the edge. And I guess what I'm mm-hmm. saying is that you never outright, outrightly admitted that that was what, what the reason might've been, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Am I, am I on the right line here? What do you think? Yeah. So maybe, I, I wasn't aware of it. Maybe I subconsciously did feel that way. I did. It's difficult. I don't like looking back on it now. I don't think that I, 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 I had felt, Oh my God, this is where I need to be. Mm. It would, don't get me wrong. It was really nice to be with my family and to see Kiara and like, you know, you, you take, you, you miss some of the things in the UK that you don't have back in Hong Kong. Mm. Um, just because that's what you're used to. But I think I was I was genuinely ready to come back to Hong Kong at the time in January. What I missed was that like that re- relationship really. Mm. Um, and actually, you know, on reflection, I was very lonely um, towards the end of um, the last couple of months, like November, December time. Um, I although I, you know, you, you have the, the very, very close relationships that we all have in, within coastal and the process, you know, it's very much from the outside, it looks like a cult. And that's what my mates from back here say is like, it looks very culty. Um, you but it's just not in the cult. Yeah, exactly. They did get the invite, but it's, but it is, it's, it only is that way. And we, you know, we were all aware of it that we're, because all of our values align and, you know, our personalities align in that way. Obviously, we're going to get on and we're going to want to want to spend time outside of work, in work. So don't get me wrong, you know, like we were spending lots of time together outside of work. Ant and I, Tammy and I, Lottie and I, Liam, Al, we were all spending a lot of time close together. But there was still, you know, everyone else had their, mm. you know, except for Ant, Tammy was away. Everyone else had their other partner to go back to. Um and I didn't, and that, you know, it's that time when you're doing a long distance relationship and you've, you're, you know, I was in, I was in a quite a bad place mentally and like Kiara knows where I was with that, but uh, I don't think actually that it was necessarily that the UK, um, that pull right there was over Christmas was, had, had convinced me and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to do a little bit more self-reflection on that, but. I think that exactly as you said, I saw the, the, the future for me with March on easier than I saw the future for process mm-hmm. because of literally just logistics of yeah. like geographically where the process is. It's like, it would probably be a harder, it would probably be harder for me to take the process or to take coastal and bring it back to the UK whether I was working remotely as like a process coach, which is something that we'd discussed, you know, as like a floating idea, whether it was opening another gym through the process programming affiliate, you know, that was another opportunity. But I, we had had the conversation when we were doing, um, you know, our, like reviews was uh, right now, I want to spend the next couple of years or next two, three years actually just being the best coach that I can be and not worrying about, any of the business stuff or anything like that. I just want to double down on being the best group coach, the best PT, the best person I can be within a, uh, you know, a condensed period of time. And then I can essentially milk you of your business knowledge and, you know, how to go about this. And then we can have the conversation of this is where I want to go. And that Mm -hmm. was genuinely what my plan was all through being in Hong Kong. And I felt like we had a lot of open conversations about that, but, um, I then saw this opportunity in the UK and it felt to me like a clearer path to what I wanted. But now that I'm in here, I actually don't know what I want, um, which I'm totally fine with Mm. because something that kind of going off on a tangent, something that I was always very, had a lot of anxiety and apprehension over when I was younger, like early twenties was what my career would be. And I always felt like, I'm, you know, I need to be at this point 
earning this much or doing this at this age and i need to be i need to be on the same do the same job and do the same thing for now so that when i'm 50 i've built up this reputation or whatever it is and i'm in a comfortably comfortable stable place and now the older i've got and ever since going to hong kong i kind of came back into coaching and was like oh no this is being within fitness in some capacity is what i'm meant to be doing oh like 100 believe that but it showed like the opportunity of coastal came up through an instagram post and i messaged alex because alex and i were mates beforehand and i knew him before and just the idea that that opportunity came out of nowhere like relaxes me to know that you never know what opportunities will arise in two, five, 10, 20 years. So don't worry about what's going on there. Just focus on doing the best that you can day to day, week to week, month to month. And in time, good things will come. And like whether that's karma or whatever it is, or you manifesting your own future, that's I firmly believe that. But I now I feel very relaxed within March on knowing that the company's going places, knowing that I'm getting a lot of recognition as a coach, which feels great. Um, and I know that if I continue to do what I do, opportunities will arise, whether that's opening other facilities around the country, around the world, whether that's being within a part of another business, whether that's setting up my own business. I actually have, genuinely don't know the answer to that question, but I'm totally relaxed about what's coming about because right now I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm just going to focus on doing the best I can there so that future me will be in a good place. I said, that's really nice to hear that last bit because that's, that's, that's exactly where I'm at. And that's actually wrote really where I've been at ever since I got into business from the very first day we set up coastal 14 years ago, which was yeah. that what I'm doing just feels like the right thing. It's enjoyable. I love it. I feel like I'm achieving growth and like, I've never been able to put a write down like one, three, five, 10 year goals. And to be mm. honest, and part, part of that has been because I've never, never wanted to set those goals. And it was like, you know, everything that has happened in my life so far has, has been a result of just doing things that I love doing and doing them consistently. And like you said, call it karma, call it, call it the universe, call it life happening for you, call it looking at li life, you know, through a half, half, full cup like you know whichever way you look at it, it's all a matter of perspective and and i guess like letting go but it's nice to hear that from you because i think you'll be the first to admit that you probably were someone that that suffered from things like imposter syndrome shiny object syndrome you know wanting to wanting to i guess feeling like you were never enough or feeling like you needed to be more or feeling like when you achieved x you would feel like y um, and to now know that through this process, you've gotten to this point now where it's like, yeah, just like, like you described, you love what you're doing and you know that by doing this, like something good will come of it or whatever will come of it will come because of the things you're doing now. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I do still very much feel that I feel like imposter syndrome very regularly. I feel shiny. I feel get, get pulled and my attention gets pulled into different things here and there all the time but uh like for example we had so marshall's kind of education side of the business is called the pfca um and they do online you know courses they do in-house seminars and stuff like that and we hosted a seminar here and jen's the co-owner with ollie asked me if i would like present with him um and i felt like oh god obviously i was like yes and i know that i would do a good job but at the same time i was like if i come gonna say something and people are gonna be like this guy hasn't got a clue what he's talking about like mm. he he's he's not worthy of being on the stage here or whatever um so you know, i get i get all of those feelings regularly but i kind of do pull myself back down being grounded of like don't worry about that just focus on doing the best that you can day to day and then good things will happen yeah, nice. And, and like in having this conversation and, and just hearing about your story and how this all transpired into you being where you are right now, and there are lots of things I think about. I think about it from like the business owner perspective, which is like how hard it is to hire someone. Um, you know, myself and Liam, we're just sitting down today talking about, you know, we're going to be looking for a coach again um, and we're going to be looking to hire people from overseas. We're going to open up to the world. And the last time we did that was when we hired yourself and him. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And we talked about, you know, like how can we be more specific with what we're looking for? How can we make this attractive to someone looking in? And who do we really want? Um, oh. And, you know, the values are important. Yes, you know, the mission, the purpose, all those things really matter. But there's other things to think about. Like, is the person coming over alone or are they coming in a, in a relationship? And, you know, one of the things I remember with you was like, I had a fear of you coming over here and exactly what you ended up feeling, which was loneliness. That was something that I was scared of. You know, like the last thing I want is someone to relocate over to a new country, other side of the world, and to feel lonely. Because part of me feels like I have a responsibility to play on that for that person. Whereas knowing mm. someone who's going to move over with a partner or a spouse, <clears throat> you know, perhaps that's a slightly easier transition. Maybe it's not an easier transition because that means you've got to make two mm. people happy. Um, so those are all things to have to have to think about. And then I think your story is the story that so many coaches go through, which is, you wow. know, like finding a job, weighing up opportunities. And like, yeah. how do you make, how do you make those hard decisions? I just listened to um, a podcast yeah. where it was from Barack Obama's book, Barack Obama, you know, when it comes to making decisions, he was talking about, you know, making the decision to invade Iraq and essentially go after Osama bin Laden. And it was like, how do you make that decision? And for him, it was just a simple weighing up of, likelihood percentages of likelihood of success and as soon as he can weigh up something where the the, the answer is in the majority then he's going to go with it so even if it's a 51 percent yeah. to a 49 always go with the 51 mm. and don't expect right. decisions to, to work out perfectly but if you weigh up the odds and you weigh up the, the opportunities and you weigh up the risk versus reward and the odds work for you do it mm. which i feel like is essentially what you did and i also know your process of doing that which i think is very similar to mine is that you're someone who likes to bring other people in to that decision making process yeah. um would you say that's would you say that's correct yeah i think i spoke to i spoke to everyone that i whose opinion who whose opinion i care about you know i spoke to you and tammy uh liam alex lottie uh Kiara, my mum, my dad, mm. my sister, like because of my couple of my best mates. So those, <laughs> I spoke to like over ten people, um, and it's just I, I just like hearing other people's opinions, and everyone's got something different to add, and don't be bought into what they've said to you, but just put it in the bank and then kind of make the best decision from there. Like I, you, as we know, it's kind of like having a conversation is almost like a form of journaling or self-reflection and you figure stuff out when you're in the middle of the conversation you're like i've just had this thought or like someone makes a point it sparks something in you and then you know i think that's a easy way of for me anyway of figuring things out um it's just that some people might not feel that comfortable to be able to share everything that they're feeling or they might not be able to communicate it as well to someone else um which i feel like i can do relatively well so and just be you know i open or vulnerable or say this is how i'm feeling and then they, they'll get a better understanding of where I'm at and then be able to maybe give me a little bit of advice or what they would do in that situation. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the only person who's going to make a decision is you. Um, mm. But by having, essentially, kind of having 10 therapists help you make that decision, um, yeah. you know, by being able to be open and vulnerable and, and share share what you're going through with them and, and see if they have questions or advice that might help you find yeah. the answer. Yeah. Can I ask you know, in terms of the process of you reaching out to other gyms, because I think this mm. is also a position that a lot of people in any industry, you know, when they're in between jobs or they're looking for something new, like how did you go about finding the next, the next job? What did that mm. process look like? It was purely through Instagram mm. and uh, it is, it's, I, th I found that, Instagram is actually a, as much as it gets a bashing and people get addicted to, you know, X, Y, Z and people have unhealthy relationships with social media. For me, it's been so good, like in terms of the connections that I've been able to build with people through just messaging someone, a platform to be able to share information to help others, um, a way for me to kind of just post about what I'm doing on my day to day, which then adds insight or creates conversation within others. And I found just by commenting, messaging people, 
like majority of the people are, are willing to help, particularly in this industry. Like people are got into it or most people got into it for reasons of being able to help others. And that doesn't just look like your 50 year old member that looks like other coaches within the industry peers. And obviously there might be people that will, um, you know, that will ignore your message or the, uh, think who's this idiot, but the, the majority of the people that I've reached out to or have had conversations with have in general been, it's been well received. They've been able to give advice or they've been able to, you know, given me what I've asked for. Um, so that's, that, that was the, that's just how I did it. I just messaged a few people that, I knew within the industry or that I built had had previously had connection with and put a couple of feelers out to people that I knew were coaches in X, Y, Z. And can you put me in contact with the right people? So unfortunately it's, it was more a case of like who I knew, but I'd actually never met Ollie. Um, it was just a coincidence that I essentially said to him jokingly, I was like, I'm sending you a cold DM quotations have you got any jobs mate <laughs> and then like elaborated a little bit more as to like I understand this is me essentially asking have you got any jobs but like and and if this if this ignore if this is ignored then fair play but um these are these are the areas of the business that I see that you're getting into these are the things that I can add value so it was more of like an elevator pitch rather than mm, just like a sales hey mate yeah. yeah yeah exactly um so yeah I mean in terms of advice to other coaches looking for work uh it's hard i couldn't i couldn't really give that much it was just it would just be reach out to people that you think you're going to get a response or people that you want to work with and hopefully you'll be able to get some some feedback or or be able to spark a conversation and put try and put yourself in the right room i do think though you had something on your side that other people looking for jobs via instagram perhaps don't have which is that you had already started to build a personal brand um mm. and what i mean by that is that whilst okay yes you were a part of coast on the process programming you were still investing time into your own social media account to put out content related to your job and coaching and mm. you as a, and sharing information with you as a person so i guess you know when you're now using your profile to now look for prospective employers on instagram you have your cv in a sense you know you mm. have what your Instagram is showing is your beliefs, your values, the things you're interested in, perhaps your coaching skill set. Uh, and that for someone who's on Instagram is that makes total sense. But I think, you know, for the person who isn't using Instagram to perhaps showcase their career, I feel like you have a little grin in your face because you're thinking about something right now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for someone who doesn't use their profile to do that, and, you know, if all you're posting about is, which is totally fine, by the way, but like, you know, you know, passing on weekends Workouts. and working or walking your dog and like what food you like, which is awesome. That's going to be very hard for someone on Instagram to to get a feel for what you might be like as a potential employee um, mm. who's now applying for a job. And I think that's actually where I wanted to go with it next is that like talk to me about Instagram now, um, because I feel like that's something you've invested and continue to invest a lot of time and energy into in building mm. your brand. And I feel like you've become even more targeted with the content that you want to create and i'm seeing yeah. more consistency from someone from the outside looking in so you know where are you at with instagram at the moment like what is your purpose with it and and you know yeah what are you what are you doing with it so it's actually something right now that i'm getting a lot of enjoyment out of um because i'm getting a lot of um a, a lot of uh, positivity from it. a lot of engagement yeah a lot of po like positive positive feedback from people that i've never met as well as people that i have met um and i think when i first started at, at, in coastal i hadn't re i literally hadn't posted any content it was no nothing that was educational or informative it was just me working out or you know food like you said and then and you gave me the advice which was don't post about stuff you don't know about just post about something that will you know speak about your experience or speak about something that you know to be true to you that has helped you or something that's pretty straightforward you'd be surprised how many people don't know about xyz just put something out there it doesn't need to be groundbreaking just put a bit of content out there and you'll be surprised how many people it might help and i think just letting go of the idea that you're being judged by other coaches which you are to a certain extent 
But at the end of the day, you're not really, obviously, unless you're trying to be a coach for coaches, that's not really your target audience. Your target audience is your average member or for most people, it's people that they want to hire them. And most coaches aren't going to hire you. It would be, it would be people that don't really know what they're doing and need some help. So that's your target audience, not your competitor who's got 10,000 more followers than you on Instagram and has, and is leader, whatever, like that's not, that's not who you need to focus on. So as soon as I had that detachment and thought, you know, I, I was just taking and, and now just take um, bits from the day. So it's like, because obviously we're coaching a lot, I'll just be like, oh, I gave this cue. Maybe there are more people. Like I did a I did an Instagram um, reel the other day on like bike seat height. And like that's, you know, the one of uh, such a basic concept. But in the gym, I kept seeing people with their seat height in the wrong position. I was like, well, if, you know, 60% of the members in our gym are setting up their bike wrong, then maybe there's 60% of the people that are following me that are doing the same thing. So I'm not trying to, you know, like um, invent the wheel. I'm just putting out bits of information that have helped other people that I've worked with and trying to put it in a way that is understandable, filtered down and understood by the layman. And that's what has changed for me in the last six months has been not uh, trying to take, whether it's complex or not, trying to take a topic and then make it as simple and as, as digestible as possible. Whereas before where I was going wrong was trying to um, be, say the most advanced word and use the most advanced concepts. And really most people are just switching off. And if you don't really know what you're talking about and you're just trying to use fancy words and just trying to use fancy concepts for the sake of being up here a certain way, you're, you're, that's not your authentic self. You're not going to do well there. Instead, just take something that you know to be true or take, some, take something that has worked for you or for someone else, filter it down so it's small, digestible, someone that has little experience or a small amount of experience can take away, implement into their life or their training. And that's what, in my opinion, is going to get engagement and it has shown to be true. And have you seen any knock-on effects? Like, have you seen any... Are there any signs for the universe that are telling you, Paddy, you got to keep on doing this. This is good. Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a sign from the universe, but just people interacting with me. Like I put, I'm putting a lot of um, detail into my stories now as well. Mm. So not just into content, um, but into just my day-to-day -day stories where I'll take um, my training snippets of like exercises that I've done. I'll basically use Instagram stories as like a training diary. And then I'll talk about like the focus or the intention or like a cue that I was thinking about with like this certain exercise and just be like, I'm doing it in this way because I'm trying to get this or like, this was my focus for this last week. I was doing this now this week, I'm trying to do that. And actually that's getting just as much, if not more engagement than any of the posts and the reels, because I think there's like a less of a barrier between messaging someone on a story and then commenting on a post. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm getting, I'll get random messages in my requests or whatever. And it's people like, I've, I've been watching your content for the last couple of weeks and my training has changed drastically. Or like, I didn't think about it this way. This is really helpful. Like I'll try it next week. Or I tried what you talked about last week, put it into my training feels much better. And I'm getting that from my met from the members here as well as people are like, mm -hmm. I actually didn't think about the seat height. Or, you know, something as small as that and actually just giving out all this information that seems pretty straightforward, but actually to a lot of people isn't. Um, it's just getting a lot of traction, a lot of people giving me positive affirmation. And that's great because that makes me feel like it's worth my time and effort. And that's the whole reason why I'm doing it is not for the clout of this is how many followers I've got or this is how many likes I've got. There's still a part of me, unfortunately, that is attached to that, but not a massive part. What really what matters is that I'm putting out information that's helping other people. Mm -hmm. And then, then in turn, I'm getting something positive from them, which is exactly why I do it. And it feels great. But it isn't Instagram. Doesn't your relationship with Instagram change so much when A, like you know who you are and what you want to be about? But B, when Instagram is just an extension of the authentic you? 
the moment yeah, what exactly. the things you post and you talk about are not you that's when it becomes hard and it becomes an effort mm. and it becomes tiring or that's you know maybe the relationship part of it is probably i think just as much attached to um what people produce as well as what people consume i think we suffer in mm. both those ways in many ways and some people are more on one than the other but i certainly feel the same way is that you know when you know who you are and who you want to be and what you want to talk about and that's just you just do you it's it's easy and it's enjoyable and it removes mm. a lot of the stresses that so many so many of us experience when we're trying to be something we're not or we're trying to be the person we aspire to be who has 10 times more followers and then we start thinking that that's the content we need to be posting and yeah that's cool i just want to say i love the content you're posting and i love that you're you have more and more clarity on what you're doing it looks like you're enjoying it and it looks like it's it's effortless thank you um it's... your your, your <laughs> well, it's role is effortless it's not effortless it's not effortless of course it's still work but no. um your role within your company within march on right now so obviously mm. i know i know i know how it's evolved and changed and what it's looking like now but it's quite different to what you were doing you know when you were with us here so what is mm. your role now and i guess you know like let's start with that then i'll, I'll pep you with some more questions but what is your role what does it look like now so i am uh, kind of unofficially the head coach here um so essentially i i was the first hire for stratford um and ollie's words not mine the team and the business of stratford was built around me um so it's then who do we need in terms of coaching in terms of staff around you and then we'll fill in the gaps from there um so you know loosely there's some management um but really what my day-to-day -day involves is coaching the classes um doing um the programming programming for members within here that might need a little bit of assistance within um you know they're working through an injury and i'll give them a few things so that they are progressing and then within x amount of weeks they can move back into um the, the program as a member of the gym um and then it'll be things like events um upcoming you know like promotions or things that we've got like for example this weekend we've got our first high rocks class um that we're offering for free for anyone to come down we've got like nearly 50 people now that are coming um to that which is awesome and we're going to do there's a high rocks event in london uh, on the 19th so we've got like three weeks of free sessions leading up to it where they'll get a bit of coaching on some of the movements and then kind of like a high rock style sort of simulation um you know lots of random different things but the majority of it is um coaching and assisting with the other coaches as well okay so going back to you know, when, when you first came to us and your goal was to like, you wanted to get as much experience, get back into coaching again, get as much mm. experience as a group coach, individual coach. And I, you know, like you yeah. said, just milk, milk us for as much, as much knowledge and experience you can get. And then at the time, I remember you had said you had this aspiration of one day owning your own gym. Before I go any further, is that still your goal? Do you still see? I don't know. Your, not sure. Okay. I don't um, know. So what, you know, when, when you were searching for this next job, which is now March on, were there specific things within the job responsibilities that you were looking for that aligned with where you were at that point in time? Or were you kind of like, oh, oh, doesn't matter what job responsibilities entail. It's more about the business and the culture and the company and the other things. It's mm. a good question. I think that, um, I think that I'd be, I'd be lying if I didn't say that my, the, the ego side of it of having more responsibility and having more senior seniority within my role didn't attract me to it because i was very much kind of in the middle at at coastal um i wasn't you know i wasn't at, at the at the top or didn't really have any sort of management or anything like that so um essentially 
I was I was basically just what one of the coaches at Coastal. Um, as a, whereas in here in this position, I am head coach or the most senior coach within this position. Uh, I was brought in for my with my experience and my expertise. Don't get me wrong; that was kind of partly why I was I was brought in at Coastal, but it was kind of it allowed what it gave me was the opportunity to um, do it my way um, and like my identity of what fitness was and how we should onboard people and how the program should be written and you know what all those things that came into play. Whereas I didn't really have any of that um, at Coastal because you've been doing it for 10 years and it was well established of this is, you know, we're already at, you know, 90% capacity or whatever. Like this is where, this is how we onboard people. This is um, what the programming looks like. This is how we coach. This is how the classes run. This is, you know, how we do our meetings. Whereas because none of that was created, it was then up to me. And obviously with Ollie involved as well. And some of the other coaches, it was how, how are we going to do this at Stratford? So then it gave me the opportunity to actually think for myself rather than just kind of singing off a hymn sheet. And it was like, is this the best way that we assess people before they come into the gym? Is this going to be the best way to onboard someone so they become a member? And all of that was like a, a very cool idea to me that it was kind of like a project that started with a blank slate that I could then put my stamp on. And that was definitely... a yeah, Can but, I ask, Paddy, what, what about all of that, though, was attractive to you? What about, like, having a senior position and being able to put your own stamp and have authority? What about the, all that was attractive to you? Um, I think maybe, and it's probably, it was, like I said, it's more kind of like an ego thing of maybe I felt like I was... Um, I felt like I was was low down on the hierarchy at Coastal and that not that that was a bad thing because I was very much like trying to be a student of every of learning from everyone but um, maybe I just felt like oh and it was kind of like I, I had accepted that I was at this this standard of coach and you know the conversations that I was having with Ollie and the people around me, I was like, oh, maybe I'm actually like worth more than that as a coach, and maybe I am. I do have more knowledge, and I am a little bit more senior than I think I am. And the idea that I could fulfil that was attractive to whether it's to stroke my ego, whether it was because like this is then this is future me a step early. This is like, because I will get to this point where I am senior, where I'm respectable from the industry, where I have people working underneath me, potentially. This is this is a kind of like the window into that opportunity. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Not sure. I think more, kind dig- of. more, more digging to be done, I think. Yeah. Can I ask? What, 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 yeah, what do you think? Oh, what, what do I think? Um... I think I think it's very admirable. This is why I love having you as a podcast. This is why I always love having conversations with you. Is that just your honesty? You know, there's so Ooh. so little people would sit and admit that I think that your ego came into play, and that you know having more seniority was important to you because maybe it was a status thing, and maybe you know that's Ooh. it looked it felt better to be viewed from the outside as someone who was higher up within their food chain yeah, versus exactly. someone who was low down. And I think that's totally natural. I've, I've felt that so many times in my coaching career. And I've also felt the opposite Ooh. where I've been like, I don't like being at the top. I actually want to be, sometimes want to be in the middle and have people above me who are inspiring me and mentoring me and teaching me. So I kind of felt felt both of them. Um, but I don't really have anything, anything else to add. I just think it's, I think it's good that you, that you acknowledge where, where those drivers came from. And that's also totally okay. I, but I guess another question is, Ooh. You know this what you what you kind of said there at the end and, I, and i'm not meaning to phrase this in a way that makes it sound bad but essentially like i can this is a shortcut to me getting to where i i know i'm going to get to anyway but i get to like shortcut this mm. process um and i guess something mm. that i thought i thought when i know that because you know like like we said you kept me in the loop the whole time and you know you asked me for a lot of advice and i really appreciated 
allow me in because i think a lot of people would probably look at their old boss and be like there's no way you know that, that i'm letting this person in but i really appreciate it and i wanted to help you as much as i could as a friend um but i guess a part of me was thinking that in the context of where you would come from which is you know being out of the industry for a really long time only being back in it for a year and it was a pretty turbulent year but i know you had progressed so much in such a short amount of time that suddenly it was like i wasn't sure if you were ready to step out of that yet and at the end of the day like everything will always work out and you are always going to be okay that's what we kept on saying like paddy whatever decision you make you will be okay because you have so many great qualities mm. going for you that it doesn't matter what you choose and where you go like you're going to be happy and you're going to be fulfilled in whatever you're doing but i guess mm. something else in the back of my mind was like you know like don't 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 take the shortcut because it's easy because you know of what you might be missing out on had you yeah. had these long routes so that's i guess there's something that I was thinking but and i think uh, and i definitely felt that a lot of of like oh i don't I don't know if I'm ready for this. Like maybe it's, it's, I'll get found out kind of thing. Um, but it's, it's also like, if I didn't take the jump, I'd never know. Yeah. And it was like the opportunity is there. So if I don't take it, then like, uh, and I, th I thought about how much I'd grown within a year. And that, that this was, this is very much, I'll be, totally honest with with this right now so within a year i was like i've learned so much i've and progressed so much as a person and as a coach because that year was so such a fast progression what does year two look like mm. and i honestly felt like it was going to be like this like it would level off a little bit and i felt like and do, like don't take this as an offense but i was like how much how much more am i going to learn from ed from Anne? from everyone else mm. um, versus going into then changing environments and going into something else. And I completely, I know 100% that I would have learned, still continue to learn loads as a coach at Coastal for, you know, 10 years or whatever. But part of me felt like I, I, I could see a plateau in my progression or like, like tail off a little bit. Whereas if I throw myself in the deep end into this opportunity, I... You know, there it's mm. it's up to me. It's on me, and like I could, because I know how I knew how much Marshall were progressing. I was like, I can like attach myself to this rocket ship, and I'll figure it out as I go. Mm. Isn't it just so good? There's just, there is just no right or wrong way to do life, is there? And it's like mm. every every cliche, like line of inspiration, always needs context because it's like one of the thing, things that you might have been telling yourself was like, and I remember you saying this, like I'd rather live knowing that I tried versus not. But then it's like, mm. does it either way you, whether you went either way, you could have applied that same statement. It doesn't actually help, you know? Yeah. Cause it was like, I would rather have tried to yeah. stay in Hong Kong and see where that takes me. Or I'd rather try to take the opportunity, you know, risk taking would have yeah. gone both ways. And it's like, yeah. I think this is I I'm kind of like my life right now where it's like sorry to sorry to cut you off there but it's having yeah, read sorry. every self help book I feel that's out there have listened to copious amount of podcasts with everyone that are delivering that like that one special line that's going to that's going to transform your life Ooh. and so so many of those lines I've I've lived by and have like been a part of my language at a certain point in life but actually now it's like. You know, sometimes, yes, that is the perfect line to get you through that obstacle that presents itself in front of you right now. But sometimes it is also totally the worst line and there's something else that you need in that yeah. moment of time. And there is just no right or wrong way to do life. And sometimes you're like, it would just be easier if there was just a right or wrong way to do it. And that would make life a lot easier. But then at the same time, yeah. it wouldn't be very interesting as well. What were you thinking? It's just, it's just a confirmation bias, isn't it? It's like you're, you, can, you can create or you can find whatever quote you want to to align with what you actually want or like mm. what you think you need yes. to do and just be like, Oh, this person said this and that makes sense to me. So I'm going with that. And then you could have, you could take this, like you said, the same quote and just flip on its head or you find a different quote that tells you the exact opposite. And you're like, well, that person told me this, so I'm going with that. So mm. who knows what it is. Who knows? Uh, all right, Paddy, what has been the biggest challenge for you in this last year? Or the biggest challenge, cool. 
We can do brackets S challenges. Challenges. Uh, I'd say in in more recent times, um, uh, I've I've struggled with um, uh, well, I've struggled with like some form of management with others um, because it's new to me and I'm quite critical of myself, but. I think rightly so. Uh, I haven't I haven't done as good a job as I could, and obviously you learn from your mistakes. That's a cliche you can live by. <laughs> um, the learn from your mistakes, and without me messing up and doing X Y Z, then uh, I wouldn't learn from them as well. But that's something that I that I found challenging is the, the the management aspect of of dealing with others. Whereas, you know, for example, at Coastal, which is my most recent, you know, experience, it was always, you know, leaning on you as to a situation of what I needed to do or what's the best way to go about this. And, you know, whether you thought you did or you didn't, you you had an answer for every question that was being posed or you created a question onto my question, which then gave me an answer or where there were questions marks within the business or we were going through a difficult time, you were able to you know, guide us through whatever you needed to because it felt like you had been there before and you were always trying to make the right decision and make an honest decision. And you had people around you that were, that were bought into that. And I think that we haven't, uh, as, a, as a team, we haven't yet created um, that clear path of this is how we do everything. So... We're going to, you know, it's, it's an easy option to take this or like we know we've done this before, so we're going to go through this path. Um, it's a little bit all over the shop and a lot of that responsibility falls on me and I haven't been as responsible as I could and that's something that I'm trying to get better at, but it's a, it's a steep learning curve for me and that's potentially like where we were talking about the opportunity being too much too soon or like not being ready for it. That's definitely something that I've kind of stepped into that I wasn't ready for and haven't put enough energy and education or ex haven't got any experience either into any of that myself or very little experience. So um, it's something that has been a big challenge for me because I'm sort of disappointed, disappointed. Yeah. Disappointed with myself with, how I've reacted in certain situations and the way that I've gone about certain things and I want to be better. It's just, I just know that it's a long road for me to get to the person or the manager or the whatever that I want to be. But to play devil's advocate, there's also no better way to learn than just being thrown in the deep end sometimes. No, exactly. For sure. And it, and it, and that's what I'm saying is it's a steep learning curve, but hopefully it's, the mistakes will allow me to then springboard onto the next thing and onto the next thing mm. um, in terms of being a good manager, not of like jumping ship and doing something else. Um, but yeah, so that's something that has challenged me for sure. And it still is very much something that I, that I'm thinking about daily that I need to do better. Um, do you want to, do you want to poke me on that at all? Or That's, that's good. No? I, know, I know. I know. No, I think that's, I mean, obviously, we can get into the specifics of, of management, but I know I understand you have a team there that you're looking after. Um, and yeah, I guess, well, I guess maybe, yeah, if there's anything else you'd like to share about like what is what is the specifics of the management that's that's challenging or you feel like you're not executing on? Um, definitely think that I uh, I haven't been as rational and as yeah, I'd say I'd say rational, but almost like emotionless, like um, and to be a good manager. And obviously, you need to have emotion, and you need to be, um, yeah, you need to be sympathetic. Well, maybe that's partly the issue. But you need to you need to have emotion as a manager, and you need to be able to make decisions without being influenced by your own personal judgment or your personal emo or your emotions that you're feeling at that time um and that's that's probably the the 
most sweeping statement, but also the most true statement that I can say is that I've let my emotions or my predisposition uh, make my decision or make me react a certain way when in hindsight or looking back on the situation, I should have gone about it in this way, which was a clearer, more rational way to go about it. Yeah, it's a hard one because as an emotional person, and I'm quite an emotional yeah. person as well, it's, you know, in the moment, you sometimes feel pressed as a leader or a manager to make a decision then and there. Um, and if you can recognize and know that you're an emotional person, I think sometimes the best thing to do is to actually not make the decision then and there. As hard as that mm. is sometimes, sometimes you just want to jump and give the magic answer or find the solution right away. Because I think a lot of times that's what we think people view a good leader to be someone who can just provide the answer and it to be the best answer. Snap judgment. Yeah, exactly. That's so often not the case at the end of the day, what people really want is the best answer at some point, how you get there. Mm. Sometimes it takes longer. And I think what I found is that, you know, not feeling the pressure to have to respond in that moment and identifying if emotions are running high and potentially this is going to be a point where I might make the wrong call or say the wrong thing sometimes it's better to say nothing at all or just to say that i need some time on this and i'll get back to you and then that's where you know having a clearer headspace and coming back with the rational is sometimes the best thing to do yeah that's good advice i think just to answer your answer your initial question we said challenges mm. um i found it very difficult since packing it in with coastal in the process um, I then wasn't really in full-time work until August. So it was, you know, four months, three, four months worth of me essentially not really, like I was doing work, but it was, you know, a few hours a day of, can you come and jump on this call or can you come here for a day or can you do that as opposed to being, you know, like day in, day out. And it was like being back on furlough back in the UK where I just, I was waking up and I didn't have a purpose and having been having that that um, contrast from having such a purpose in Hong Kong and having so much clarity and so much routine, and this is what I'm doing on a, my day to day basis. This is what my week looks like. This is what's coming up next month, and it was all just kind of open ended and very loose. It was very difficult uh, for me to create structure um, because I'm someone that does well off of a routine and off structure, and I didn't have it and you know, habits and everything else started to slip. And it was quite, yeah, it was mentally quite a challenging time for me. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I know, I know about those times because we spoke about them and I can only imagine um, how challenging it must have been. But I think at the same time, mm. knowing that you had light at the end of the tunnel, that you were moving yeah, somewhere, exactly. probably very different to someone who's going through that and doesn't have that light at the end of the tunnel. No, exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's what I said to myself was when I was in it, I was like, I, I was like, I would journal very regularly about that and be like, it, in three months or in two months time, you're going to be in London, in your routine, tired from working. Um, and that will be a good thing. So mm. you, like current you wants future you. So when you get there, don't, you know, don't worry, don't, um, you know, piss, piss on it. It'll be, it'll be good. <laughs> uh, all right. Last one, Paddy, which areas yep. in your life have you grown the most recently? Mm. Um, I don't actually, I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like I, I would say in um i would say my my confidence as a coach um i think that my um I, i'd say that my my personal development on you know um self awareness i think has perhaps not hasn't got less but it's maybe stagnated um and something that i'm telling myself is that it's okay that that's happened and I can't always work on myself all the time if, you know, there are other things that I need to work on that I need to do. And I'm telling myself that, like, don't worry about it. It's okay. Um, but I think that's probably the, the area that I've grown the most is my confidence in my ability as a coach 
and my um, clarity for why I'm doing what I'm doing. Nice. Love it. Yeah. What do you think? I knew that was a question that was coming. Because you, because you give me good insight, and um, yeah, you've always got something else to add. So, go on. I think this is just genu- this is genuinely one of those questions, though, that it's like this can only come from you. You know, what, what mm. growth do you feel like you've experienced? Um, ah, uh, I think on on the personal growth, it's like, I guess it's just on on the term growth in general that it's like you're right. There's only so much growth that we can be attaining in the in the various aspects of our lives at one time just like yeah. you know we can only learn so much or do so much in our day because we only have finite resources every day to put towards the things we want to do and you know when i look at your time in hong kong like there was so much rapid growth in your the personal you uh, but the professional you as well but i also know that 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 rate of growth is you know the, the i guess something that allowed you to have that rate of growth was a fact that you were probably by yourself and outside of your coaching hours that there weren't too many other commitments that you had to actually commit towards, uh, which yeah. allowed you to pour all your energy and resources into those two things. And I think, yeah. you know, when you, if I look at your life now, there's a lot more and it's just different things on your plate. Now you've got relationships. So a relationship, you have a brand new role. You've got new job responsibilities that you're having to learn fast on, which means that really like, other things that have to be put on pause and just like in training if we use a training metaphor like we can't be progressing everything at one time we choose the one two three things that we want to create adaptations with and everything goes into maintenance mode uh and i guess that's kind of where you're at right now is that your personal life is is in maintenance mode and you're you're putting your energy and resources into these other aspects of life um but i think it doesn't mean that maintenance mode doesn't doesn't mean you're not improving Right. No, exactly. some, some sometimes it means that okay, rather than acquiring new knowledge, you just put it into practice the knowledge you acquired in the past and getting, yeah. exper- getting experiences. And I guess that's like I think about that um, as like you know, yeah, it's like learning versus experience, or like acquiring knowledge versus experience. Like you have to do the two. Uh, you know, if you're just acquiring new information all the time, let's let's think about it like an educational context you're just reading textbooks doing courses all the time but you're not actually practicing the craft of coaching you yeah. need both of them don't you you've got to have periods of time where you're learning you've got to have periods of time where you're executing that learning and putting it into practice and that's really yeah. where wisdom is then formed is the culmination of both those two things but any of those yeah. two things in isolation doesn't lead to wisdom and you said it you said exactly that when when i was first coming into the gym because I hadn't, although I hadn't been coaching on the floor for a while, I had still very much been part of the community and was absorbing lots of information, still like listening to podcasts, reading books, like buying PDFs and doing courses and things like that. So it was like a case of you you take all this knowledge and just, and just, and just apply it now rather than just trying to add in lots of new knowledge. And that's something that I'm reminding myself because in, you know, from April, I've done uh, quite a few courses and like bought a few PDFs. And now I'm like, I was actually like pursuing a mentorship or for a couple of people. Um, and I'm actually going to not in the short term because I haven't really, I've kind of just like skimmed through these courses, done it, what made my notes. And now I need to like actually put it into practice. And then I'll think about mm. something else. Yeah. I remember saying to you, I remember the conversation was like, uh, what I'm thinking about doing this course. And you think about doing a course, like, you know, would, would you recommend I do it? And I was just like, Paddy, you know, more than 99% of coaches out there, you just need to practice coaching and applying Ooh. all that knowledge you have currently stored up in your head and actually Ooh. figuring out like what works, what doesn't, who works with what. And like, actually just, you know, that's again, going back to the wisdom. Um, so yeah, that's, that's cool. That cool. That that stuck with you. Mm. Yes. Nice. Nice guys. Crucially. Patrick, uh, thank Ed. you for being thank you for being a guest. How does it feel being a guest on the podcast? Can I just? It's say? great. It's like I never left. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was always it was like we had a very brief chat and start. It was always me asking. Well, it wasn't always, but Not like always. Uh, we were you know, us having you know like back and forwards. But uh, th- and this is the issue is that like now this is our third call where we have I literally don't know anything about you. I haven't spoken 
I haven't asked you and like really got an understanding of what's going on with you because the last three calls have all just been about me. And then we'll get to the end of the call and I'll be like, Ed, how are you? Like, I've got to go now, buddy. So, um, <laughs> all right. Well, avoidant. Our, next, our next one, you can, uh, you can pepper me. Yeah, cool. Great. Right. Well, Perfect. Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for being back, my friend. We all miss you. We all love you lots. We're all stoked to see you crushing life over there. Um, and you know, we obviously, we had Ollie on the, on the podcast not long ago. So, you know, yeah. you're in a great organization doing amazing things as well. And, you know, you definitely 100% deserve to be there. And with whatever else is going to come for you in the future, you also deserve all of that good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. I love you and miss you all too.